So it's just five o'clock. <clears throat> uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to Black. Oh, I've got the wrong. Here we are in beautiful downtown Jaffrey for the last session of the third season of Stories to Share. I am Joe Steinfield. I am the moderator of this program. And how many of you are attending Stories to Share for the first time? Welcome. Welcome. I can assure all of you that next season, the first Friday of each month, starting in October, will be terrific. But we're not done with this season. And we're very fortunate to have someone here today who can speak on a subject which, as I look around the room, should be of great interest <laughs> to all of us. Healthcare from an insider's perspective. Dr. Caruso, until about a year ago, was the CEO of the Cheshire Medical Center, which, as you know, is part of Dartmouth Hitchcock. He went to uh, University of Buffalo, obtained his medical degree from New York Medical School, uh, picked up a master's of public health at Dartmouth, practiced medicine with his wife, also a doctor, in Maine for some years, decided to go somewhere else. He put his wife in charge, as I recall, mm -hmm. and she found Keene, where they moved, where he practiced family medicine, and ultimately in 2015 became the CEO of the hospital. Uh, they have two sons who are doctors, uh, a grandson and another one on the way. I assume they will become doctors. <laughs> And Don Caruso is going to speak on the subject of healthcare today, an insider's perspective. I hope everyone will stay for the reception after and get a chance to chat. We're very happy and honored to have you here. Don Caruso. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate, I appreciate the introduction. Um, I, I just look at myself as, as a doc who had the opportunity to kind of run a hospital at an exciting time, and then all of a sudden COVID came along. And I say an exciting time because I'm going to talk about healthcare, and a lot of it is my perspective, a lot of it is, you know, actual things that happened, um, but some of it really is um, kind of conjecture because we really don't know where healthcare is going. And I can tell you where it's going is probably not good unless it changes. But before I, I, I get into that, I wanted to kind of level the playing field so we all know a little bit about healthcare and some of the things that you know, are really going on. And, and the first one to know is that the US spends per capita almost twice as much as any other developed nation. That's an awful lot of money. It actually ends up being somewhere about $4.5 trillion a year, or about 18, over 18% 18 of the um, gross domestic product is spent on health care. So that's an awful lot of money that goes into taking care of all of us. The good news, and this is, might be a little bit dated, I don't have the most recent um, information in terms of the cost, and it really, that cost for, uh, has been growing for many years. It finally plateaued the past couple of years at somewhere around six and a half percent. The reason, though, has to do with high deductible health plans, and that people aren't going to get care. And so the mechanism to control costs is not the right mechanism, but it's what's in place right now to actually kind of temper the rising cost of health care to all of us. Important to know that about 40% of the insured population, now these are people who actually have insurance, are delaying their care. They've decided to wait. And they wait because 
the cost is too high. They have these high deductible plans. They actually can't afford these high deductible plans, but we say they have health care. And, and to me, that, that it's a little bit of a conundrum. One of the biggest costs in health care has to do with specialty drugs. A good friend of mine sitting in the front row knows that really, really well. Um, and that specialty drugs have jumped astronomically. If you have to take a specialty drug right now, most of the time, even people who have insurance have to have some kind of supplemental coverage for things that are pretty basic. And that, you know, unless you're lucky enough, maybe I say lucky enough, but if you're on Medicare and you need a diabetes drug, um, things like Trulicity, Ozempic, all these things you see on TV, they are, they're, it's covered by Medicare after you meet your deductible and all those kinds of things. But people who are actually have other reasons to use it and don't have Medicare, aren't old enough to have Medicare, they're paying out of, the, out of pocket somewhere between $700 and $1,000 a month, which is astronomical when you think about why, why would you actually do it. And the reason you would do it is the medications actually work. They make a huge difference. And, and, but this is really what we're facing, is that we can't afford to have some of the best quality interventions that have been created. Important to know, what do we get for that $4.5 trillion? Well, we don't have the best outcomes in the world. World Health Organization, um, and this, the most recent is 2022 that I could find, um, we're 11th. We're 11th, which basically means babies who are born don't have the lowest infant mortality rate in the world. I, don't, I no longer know the number. A year ago, I knew the number. A lot of things I've forgotten in a year of not practicing. Um, but we used to be somewhere around 15th. Um, but we're not one, considering all the money we pay for health care. And so we pay an exorbitant amount of money probably way more than healthcare is worth, that's coming from a physician, that's coming from a CEO of a hospital, way more than, than it's worth, and our outcomes just aren't really what they should be based on developed nations in the world. Well, why is that? Well, it has to do with how healthcare is structured. And, and I wanna talk a little bit about something called fee-for-service. I'm actually gonna come back to this slide in a second, because I want to talk about fee-for-service and what fee-for-service is to make sure people understand. Fee-for-service is the way most physicians get paid, most laboratories get paid, most um, environments where something is generated. So if you have a radiology lab and you're taking x-rays, this is typically the way you get paid. And, and I call it the widget model. You do something, you get paid. And what that does is starts to create imbalances because there are things that actually can't function that way. But the reality is that the way the world is set up, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm a little tough on insurers because I think the insurers, and in particular our government as an insurer and as the biggest insurer, um, is driving the problem that we face today. And that you as an individual have a problem, you go and see a provider, like I say, the provider can be anybody, it can be a physical therapist, it can be a doctor, it can be a nurse, and we do something to you. We do a procedure, we give you a medication, we give you advice, and we get paid. Drives an incredible amount of profit in that model when you think about the fact that the reimbursement usually is far greater than what actually is occurring. And so the widget model drives cost dramatically. And there's nothing that says this care is good. There's nothing that says that these pills are the right pills or the procedure is the right procedure. We're just getting paid. And, and that's really the way the system is designed. But it's not the only way we get paid. We also get paid in particular in a hospital model in a very different way. In a hospital, we tend to get paid in a mechanism that moves risk, that moves the risk of the dollars. And what that means is that the insurance company says, you're gonna go and have your hip replaced. 
Well, we don't really care if there's a complication. We're only going to pay that hospital $18,000 for that hip repair. That's roughly the, what, what reimbursement is, but it's, very, it's different for each insurance company. And, and for Medicare, it's also different. But roughly, we're going to pay $18,000. We don't care how long you stay in the hospital. We don't care how many complications, interventions, other things you need to have done. But we're only going to pay the hospital $18,000. That's called diagnostic-related groups, meaning we pay for a diagnosis. A little bit different. Starts to cut the cost and puts the onus on the hospital to do the work. In some of the best-run insurance companies, the best-run hospitals, when there's a partnership, they actually move all the way to what's called capitation. And we, as individuals who consume health care, are very afraid of capitation. Many, many years ago, I came out of training, and, and we were really talking at that time about managed care and how bad managed care was because it really looked like and really was created at that time as gatekeepers and trying to prevent care. But really, what capitation does is say, you're going to assume risk for a population. Works really, really well in some places. And in particular, when you look at those places, their outcomes are outstanding because the insurance company and the hospitals work together. They have lower complication rates. People return to the OR less frequently for, for bleeding. They have less um, problems with um, allergy and allergic reactions. And it's because people are paying attention to quality. They're also paying attention to the patient experience which is really important. So capitation is not something that we're really comfortable with, but it works. It works extremely well, um, and yet uh, people are afraid of it. And, and partly why I like to talk, and when Joe asked me to talk, he said, you know, I don't know how many people are going to come. I said, even if one person comes and they hear the fact that the way we provide health care right now is not good, we have to change. We as individuals have to accept that it needs to change. But there are better ways to do what we're doing. We have to kind of start to think about that. And I'd like to see people talk about that if you have a place that you go and you meet people and you say, you know, I heard this guy talk. He's not real bright, but he is a doctor, so he must have something. But he was talking about this concept of capitation and better outcomes and getting paid for those better outcomes because that's really where Healthcare gets better. Well, the other things that are good that are happening in healthcare right now is this concept of a culture of safety. Now, the problem is no one pays for this culture of safety. There's an expectation that hospitals and physicians will keep individuals who come into the building safe. And a classic one that very few people know about, but it's, it's been in place for quite a few years and has dramatically improved things. And if you think about probably, it's probably closer to 15 years ago, and you would see in, in New York Times and, and, or, some, or some large newspaper, LA, um, LA Times, that were, where someone would have wrong site surgery, meaning they had their wrong kidney taken out or they had the wrong knee operated on. You don't hear that as often. The reality is it's not happening like was happening. It has to do with a very simple intervention. And that intervention actually, and it's kind of hard to talk about the airlines, but the airlines still do really well in terms of safety. And, and, and it's a checklist. It's called the surgical checklist. And in the surgical checklist, someone, when we do it right, the physician basically goes through a list of things in the operating room before any incision is made and multiple questions are asked and answered before they move ahead. That's how we've actually managed to make surgery safer in our country. Very simple thing, doesn't cost a whole lot of money, doesn't cost a whole lot of time. Getting physicians to chain, oh my gosh. Pretty, pretty painful, pretty painful. Important to know that reimbursements are declining. Now you say, how, Caruso, how can you say that? My cost of my health care has gone up 10%, 12%. Every year, how could the reimbursement for hospitals and physicians decline? It has to do with where does the money go. It actually doesn't go to the hospital. A hospital might get a 1% increase in a commercial insurance um, negotiation. 
the commercial insurers passing on a 10% increase because the money goes really to their, their shareholders. And so the reality is the reimbursement's decreasing, which actually what that starts to drive is starts to cause problems for hospitals in terms of meeting margins. And even not-for-profit hospitals have to have a margin. Why do they have to have a margin? They actually have to reinvest in themselves. They actually have to replace equipment. They, ha they have to replace that CAT scanner because the technology moves on. They have to buy an MRI scanner. When I came out of training, there was no MRI scanners. It didn't exist. They were, in, they were basically in, not even in academic institutions, they were in research centers. But then, then they had to buy them. And now you buy them, five years later, a new model comes out. And, and if you don't go buy the newer model, you can't keep up with the quality of care that needs to be delivered. And so when the margin isn't there, it's really, really hard to maintain your infrastructure and that the physical plants are aging. And people said, said to me, well, you've done a really good job at Cheshire. It looks good. I said, you don't know how many things we've had to put off because we really have struggled to maintain a margin at all. Informa information technology, it's expected. Probably about five years before COVID, so probably 2014, electronic medical records were starting to come out. People were a little bit, you know, wary of them. I was wary of them. I was a champion for them because I could see what they could potentially do for individuals in terms of communicating. And communication between physicians is critical for people to get the right outcomes. Everyone needs to know what medication you're on. And you know, sometimes you're in that exam room with a doc and you forget an important medication. And if it's not written on something that you're seeing the specialist, impossible for that specialist to know what it is. But if there's an electronic medical record, and nowadays all of them talk to each other, um, it actually creates impressive outcomes in terms of preventing, again, having a safe environment. So electronic medical records have come a long way. However, it's put a huge burden on physicians. I'm gonna talk about physician burnout in a couple minutes. The reality is, Prior to COVID, the biggest driver of physician burnout and physicians leaving healthcare had to do with the electronic medical record because it really is not user friendly. It's a lot of work for a physician to input data and figuring out how to actually do that with a team around you is really critical to make that actually effective. One of the things that it, there really is, if you talk to people who know about the economics of healthcare, it's really clear that we can't continue down the path we're going in terms of that sustainability from the cost perspective. Forget about Medicare and all the fighting in Washington over how do you fund it all. It's just not feasible that what we have is gonna continue 10 and 20 years from now because the cost can't keep going up for individuals or not individuals, businesses, 11, 12, 15%. Hospital faces the same thing. Its insurance rates went up just like everybody else's. It's astronomical, those cost increases. And so they're not sustainable. But there is an answer, and I want to try to have you, help you understand that answer. And an answer in my mind, and a big piece of my learnings over the years, whether that was as a CEO, as a physician, as a, a student at the Dartmouth Institute, trying to understand how can healthcare be better? How, it's gotta be here. And clearly, if you look at countries like Sweden and Norway that have healthcare systems that are much less costly and have outcomes that are significantly better than ours, how come we can't get there? How do we get there? And it really has to do with this concept of value-based care. Value-based care is paying for value paying for good outcomes, not paying for the widget. We'll change. In the US, we're really good at, at saying, hey, if you pay me for something, we're really good at figuring it out, how to get there. But we've got to get there. One of the things that is part of that trend of value-based care, because people who have to see it as valuable, is the patient. So the patient experience has to be good. Patient experience, 
I'm retired a year. The number of times I've tried to get through to have someone answer my question has been astronomical. And I know people. It's astronomical. And so the patient experience is not the best. And how do we actually change that? Because if we started to say, we're going to pay you for patient experience, people will start to figure out better ways to do what we do. You know, I actually, I, I like to use electronic systems to communicate. And so Cheshire has something that through the medical record I can commu communicate with my doc. And so my doc, in, in their infinite wisdom, said to me, so do you use my DH? I said, yes, will you answer it, was my question. And I said, yes, I will. I said, okay, good, then I'm going to keep seeing you. Because we really do need to have easier and better ways to do things. And these are some of the trends that are going on that are good, and some of the trends that are going on that aren't good. I talked about uh, methods of paying hospitals, and I talked about uh, medical widgets and fee-for-service. But can we really, is it possible to improve health care? Well, prior to COVID, there was a big push by the Institute for Health Improvement. And they basically said, we think if we focus on three things, and it was called the triple aim at the time, if we focus on populations, if we focus on experience of care, and we focus on cost, we think we can fix the system. Well, they didn't really hit it the first time they thought about it because what they missed was the provider. And they missed the fact that physicians were leaving healthcare earlier than my predecessors, who would stay until they were 70 or 80, and physicians were leaving in their 40s and 50s. And it was really driven by this lack of a healthy experience in the exam room where the computer was in between the patient and the physician. And so they said, we need to focus on the quadruple aim, not the triple aim. And we need to really focus on resiliency and, and provider well-being. Well, you can do those things and transform the healthcare system in a value-based way. And so I borrowed this slide from a good friend of mine who said, we can actually make these changes. And that if we create something that's called the enhanced medical home, Enhanced medical home essentially means it's no longer the physician that has all the responsibility for your care. Physician still owns all of the pieces, but they need people around them to actually make sure you have better health outcomes, to make sure you get the things you need to do. You need to, the physicians need to rely on their nurses. They need to rely on the lab, and they need to communicate and connect better. As individuals, we need to think differently and we need to think that if I, if I talk to the nurse on the phone, if the office practice is doing what it's supposed to do and doing it well, you have to think about that nurse talking to you as if the doctor's talking to you. And that's the way I've always used my nurses. Is I would tell them exactly what to say. And so when the nurse talked to the patient, typically it was my words that they were using. And that, that's part of this concept of medical home, but it's really part part of the concept of an extended group of people taking care of you because healthcare has gotten really complicated. Healthcare is no longer about having a sore throat and getting better or having chest pain and getting better. It's really about having a chronic disease, managing the diabetes so that you don't develop the vascular disease, you don't develop the kidney disease, you don't develop the heart disease. Because we have interventions and we have knowledge, one single physician can't own all of that responsibility. It's just not possible. It's just, it's just too much information. But they can coordinate it. And that's really where this concept of an enhanced medical home comes from. It also requires care management. It requires someone to manage all these pieces to make sure that if you have to have a hip replacement, that part of the plan for hip replacement is you're going to go to physical therapy. And, and we're going to make sure you get there because sometimes you can't get there. Sometimes you don't have a ride to get there. And so we're going to manage your care. If we do that well, <coughs> we'll improve the outcomes and we'll get, you'll get value for your money. We also need to engage you and activate you. We need to get you to do the walking after that hip surgery. See, my neighbors had some 
healthcare problems, and it was really clear that their docs told them to walk because they hadn't seen them walking, and now they're walking. And that's great, and, and that's activation. It doesn't take rocket science to activate us. It de just needs direction. It's also about post-acute care partnerships because it's too expensive for the hospital to do everything. So if you go and you have some kind of relationship, for me it's the Y, I go to the YMCA, so I can get on treadmill and I can go for a 40 minute walk in the middle of the winter in Keene, New Hampshire when the snow's on the ground, um, that's what I'm gonna do. But you have to have a partner, some other mechanism, because you really can't afford to go to physical therapy for all your, all your needs but you can go to partners, and that's really important. But really clear that we need to align the payers. The payers need to help drive this because this concept of value-based care has been around for quite a long time. It goes back to well before Obamacare or ACA, depending upon what you like to call it. Um, and the reality is that this, this concept works when we look at really big um, healthcare organizations, and, and if you go and you look to the West Coast, they do it really well with some of those institutions on the West, the West Coast. We just don't do it here in the Northeast real well. And then, as I mentioned, we need to have technology to kind of pull it all together. And so this is really about how do you transform what we have today into something that actually can provide value for you in healthcare. If we do it, <coughs> The experience of healthcare will be better. We'll lower the cost per capita because essentially we're focused on not how many people do we see, but what do we do when we see you? Or what do we do if we don't see you? Because we have to do things when we don't see you as well because there's value in talking on the phone or giving you advice and having you take the responsibility and activate yourself. And if you think of it as a population, you can actually focus the right things on the right people. Because our healthcare system right now is really designed that everybody gets the same thing. Everybody comes into the office, the physician decides, you get a medication, you're gonna see the specialist, you're gonna have a procedure. Everybody gets that. And sometimes you don't need that. Sometimes you don't need a pill. But there are people who need those things. And it really is this concept of thinking about people who are at the highest risk, People who have chronic diseases, that if we don't pay attention, their risk is gonna get higher, and so that rising risk group is a really critical portion of things that we focus on. And then it's the low risk patients. If you're a 25 year old and you are active and you run, do you actually need an annual physical? Data says no. People call and ask for it. They actually demand it because their insurance will pay for it. And, it, and it's like, you're fine. You, you come in for your, when you have a problem, we'll take care of you, but you're 25. Come back to me when you're 35. So different interventions for different age groups is a really important way for us to think about how do we provide healthcare? Because right now everybody's trying to get in and no one can get in, or at least it's really difficult. In my experience, it's really difficult to get in. In my mind, healthcare costs will drive that change. Insurance costs will increase and cover less in the near term, and we're seeing that already. We're seeing how insurance companies are passing on the cost to ind individuals now as a way to lower the cost of care. Healthcare reform, clearly a hot potato. We go from ACA is good to ACA is bad, Medicare needs to be cut, we can't possibly cut Medicare. And, the politicians don't really want to perturb the system. And my personal feeling is the advice they're getting is the wrong advice. Because if they, all they focus on, if we perturb the system, it's going to cost more. In reality, if you, if you make interventions in the right way into the system, it can actually cut the cost. Accountable care networks will continue to emphasis on keeping their populations healthy with a more long-term view. And that's really the focus of these accountable care organizations. And prior to COVID, accountable care was the, the movement to the future in terms of how do we actually cut the cost and have better outcomes. 
and it really was about that physician practice accepting the responsibility to take care of you and not just provide the widget care. Risk sharing in ACOs will inevitably, inevitably give way to capitation because in my mind, again, these are, the, in my mind, capitation has been shown to work time and time again. It's our willingness to accept it and accept the change that goes with that. Now I can tell you, I, I really believe in, in capitation and in, in things that others would say get, get in the way between them, themselves and their physician. I can tell you some of my best experiences during managed care time were because I had to actually manage the care. I had to figure it out. I couldn't just leave the person hanging. And that's really the responsibility of the physician to actually figure that out and understand that. If we think about health, health reform and insurance exchanges, they play a huge role. In 2016, a lot of things started to move. <coughs> there were a lot of private alternatives, and things started to happen. And COVID came along and everything kind of fell apart. But things are starting to move with the private exchanges. However, because they didn't implement everything, cost didn't come down, and they passed the cost on. And so those are the things that actually, if you don't, if you leave parts out, it's going to get worse. In the end, I really believe that we are the determinant of our own health status, that we can rely on docs, we can rely on surgeons. However, if we don't do the things, and my wife always tells me, you got to stop having pizza. <laughs> you got to go for a walk. Until we do those things ourselves, expecting health care to kind of keep us healthy doesn't make a lot of sense. We actually have to own some of this stuff, um, which, which is a little challenging. And it's challenging in the Northeast where the weather isn't always great, but we have to figure those kinds of things out, unfortunately. I want to leave it open for questions. I'm a little bit earlier than I thought, but I think it's good to have some time to ask questions. I do want to talk one, about one thing before I turn over questions. I want to talk a little bit about COVID. I, talk, I mentioned multiple times how COVID got in the way. How, how did COVID actually get in the way? Well, hospitals and physician practices, <coughs> as I said, are built around this concept of taking care of you when you're sick. And they really aren't built around public health types of initiatives. Um, they're not really built in a way to uh, make sure that everyone gets the care that they need to get. Now, for an value-based system, that actually makes a difference. But COVID comes along, and we turn around and, and we say, um, you need to mask. You need to get immunizations. You need to socially distance. And the reality is there's a significant number of people that didn't want to buy into those concepts. So when they didn't buy into the concepts, which is okay in my book, you know, healthcare is there to take care of you if you get COVID. The problem really was too many people decided not to do those things. And so what happened, more people developed COVID than the healthcare system could actually manage in the way it's created. Because as I said, the healthcare system is really there to take care of you when you're sick. However, taking care of you when you're sick doesn't pay the bill for health care. <coughs> Think about going to the emergency room. Think about going to the emergency room with a, that you've fallen. It's 10 o'clock at night. You've fallen, fell in the bathtub. You break your arm. If you're lucky, you break your arm. You don't break your hip. And you go to the ER, and there's a physician there. There's a nurse there, there's a, radiology, there's a radiology tech there. Usually there's a radiologist somewhere, for us they may be in Dartmouth, who can look at the x-rays, but all of those very expensive people are there to take care of you when it happens. And there isn't enough of that happening all the time to, to warrant the cost. And so the ER is a very, very expensive place to run. So COVID comes along <coughs> and we say, you know what? We have to take care of all these really sick people. 
And we're going to have to stop doing things that actually generate money for us. And the biggest thing that got stopped was elective surgical care. So people stopped having their hip replacements. Now, when you need your hip replaced, you need to have your hip replaced. But you're probably not going to die. Probably, I say, because if you don't walk and you don't do anything, you're probably shortening your lifespan. But in the short run, you're not going to die from not having your hip done today or tomorrow or a month from now. And yet, if you have COVID and you have comorbidities and you ended up in the hospital, you're actually taking on resources or consuming resources that the hospital had to take care of people who had to have hip surgery. So we had to stop doing hip surgeries. The big problem with that, those are the most lucrative things hospitals do, is elective care, especially elective OR care. And so right now, hospitals are in this recovery mode. Even a year later, I've talked to my, the person who took over for me, and they're struggling to, to meet margins, just like we did prior to COVID. But the reality was COVID put them even further behind the eight ball in terms of being able to, to, to pay individuals. Well, people worked really, really hard during COVID. And when you say you can't give a raise to those who worked really hard, they start to burn out. Many reasons that burnout occurred during COVID um, and drove physicians and nurses to say, this healthcare is not the right thing for me. It goes back to that patient experience. You start getting people who don't have who have not been in healthcare for a long time, or burnt out individuals who don't care anymore. Um, <coughs> that really becomes very problematic for individuals in all the things we're talking about in terms of patient experience, in terms of the cost of care, and in terms of outcomes. Because all you need is one burned out physician not to do that surgical checklist for wrong site surgery to happen. And so those are the conundrums in healthcare, and, and that's why I'm happy to talk about it, even being retired. My wife looked at me and said, wow, I didn't know you still had a suit coat that you could put on. <laughs> I said, yeah, I could find good reasons, and this is a good reason. So I want to thank you for inviting me today. Hopefully there was information here that was helpful to you. Yes, there's a lot of issues in our healthcare system. You all feel them every day. But I do believe there's an answer. And at some point, we're going to have to get there. And I think what will get us there is just the cost of care is going to get too exorbitant. But hopefully, in the meantime, your voices can get added to mine saying, we've got to have change. We've got to do something different than we're doing. So thank you very much. Joe, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. When I introduced Dr. Caruso, I forgot to mention that his hobby at the moment is building a replica of a 1943 19-foot Chris Craft with the help of his son, except I'm not sure if he's helping these things. He's not helping a whole lot right now. And I was going to ask as my question, how's it, how's it coming, Doctor? It's, go think... it's going well. I was actually up there working on it last weekend, got quite a bit done. My son is actually coming to spend five days with me. I think he actually expects to go fishing. So I think we'll do a little fishing, and then we'll do a lot of Chris Craft work. Well, I want to go for a ride in your Chris Craft. First question. Um, I have, I'm having problems with the word application. Mm -hmm. it, um, the method the end of a continuum that said high risk in contrast to low risk, is that a goal? Can you just talk a little bit about that, the use of that word? Yeah. Yep. So capitation essentially is a term that means there are dollars that get, get distributed for a group of people. So if you're part of a healthcare system, you're part of um, Geisinger, and you need to go have care. Geisinger says, you're, you're part of this doctor's panel of patients. We're going to give you, we're going to give that doctor $20 a month to take care of you as an individual. It's up to that doctor now to make sure you get all the care you need. Because if not, the insurance companies are going to continue to, to let them take care of you. The insurance companies are going to? Let the doctor take care of you. Because the insurance company has an expectation that the doctor has to meet. That the doctor has to make sure you have your blood pressure checked. 
the doctor has to make sure that you get weighed, that if you have heart failure, you don't get admitted to the hospital because they're actually giving you the right medications, that you actually have to go and see the specialist to manage your heart failure because your heart failure is so complicated, and if I don't manage it well, you'll end up in the hospital. And so capitation is a way for the physician to get paid a lump sum every month, no matter what, no matter how often you need to come in as an individual. And so it's much more of a risk for the physician. If you're a healthy 25-year-old, that's great. I want you on my panel of patients because you're never going to come in. But if you have heart failure, there's a lot of risk for me to manage you correctly so that you don't have essentially all the needs of expense because that's how the, the, the insurance company manages it is looking at how expensive you are to them. So a doctor would have, um, for the sake of argument, uh, 100 patients. They would receive a monthly fee for those 100 patients, whether they saw them or not. Correct. Now, does that only apply to the GP or does it apply to the specialist? Applies to the specialist too. Specialists as well. So it just depends on how it's structured. So at, for, at Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente, which is one of the biggest capitated organizations, and they have both physicians and the insurance, and they have some of the best outcomes in the nation. And so those physicians get paid based on capitation, whether you're a GP, or whether you're a general surgeon, or whether you're an orthopedic physician. Obviously, they get paid different amounts, um, but that's how, that's, how they, that's how they do it. So usually it gets back to that activation, you as an individual saying, my hip bothers me so much, <clears throat> I'm going to go see my, my family doc. Family doc looks at the x-ray, but most of the time hip replacements really have to do with your level of discomfort, not an x-ray, even though people think of it as the x-ray is what's important, now nah, the x-ray is irrelevant. It's really how, how, if you can't do what you need to do, we need to do an intervention. And so you in that, primary care physician making the decision together, I need to go see, and I'm ready to go see the orthopedic specialist to have my hip replaced. So, you know, does the doctor who's doing your recommending get penalized for doing this? Uh, is there any penalty? So if they, if they, so it gets back to that population picture. <coughs> if they're doing interventions on people who are low risk, then there's a penalty. If they're doing people in that rising risk group, that middle risk group, meaning I'm preventing you from ending up in the highest risk group, then there's no penalty. In fact, there's usually some kind of bonus back to that, that physician because you're doing the right thing. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, what I'm hearing is this, you're part of your definition of accountable care. Yes. Uh, accountable care is a point on that spectrum where all the way to the right side, all the way to your right side was capitation. And so accountable care is a form, but the payments are different because the payments for the specialists in accountable care are much more widget related. So it gets back to that question around how does a specialist get paid. In accountable care, they still get paid a fee for service dollar amount. And so there's not a lot of incentive for the surgeon to say, do you really need to have the surgery? Um, and, and so it becomes, it's a little bit different, just a little bit different. Uh, Pat. Uh, yeah, I have a more general type question. Um, I have at least two to three colleagues who are The question has to do with how hard it is to get into a medical school and why is it a closed shop? I think that's the question. Yeah, and so there are a limited number of slots in the country in medical schools, but also in residency because you, you come out of medical school and you're not really ready to be a doctor yet, so you go to residency and you get hands-on experience. <clears throat> So we have a residency here in our region for the first time ever now with our new family medicine residency program over at Cheshire Medical Center. 
it is so tightly regulated by the federal government. And the federal government makes a decision on can you actually open a residency. And the hoops that you have to jump through to actually do that are phenomenal. And so, and I can tell you, when I first came here over 30 years ago, I knew that this was an area that a family medicine residency could actually flourish because people believe in primary care here. You go to New York City, people don't believe in primary care. They go see their orthopedic specialist. I have a cousin who goes to the orthopedic specialist for his toenail problems. <clears throat> I said, why, are you going to, why don't you go see your family doctor? Oh, I don't have one. We believe in primary care here. And, but to actually make it happen has taken 30 years of my time to make this happen because it's not that easy. Why do they regulate it so tightly? I don't have the answer to that. Maybe others do, but I don't. Back in the 1990s, a limitation on the number of Medicare-funded residency slots was established as a small component of a large bill, and it hasn't changed since then, even though the demand is enormous. So it goes back to politics and government funding. Yep, yeah, exactly. Is that a question? <laughs> no, it's an answer. I have a question. Go ahead. At least since the 1970s, uh, Healthcare uh, thinkers have referred to the Iron Triangle. And the Iron Triangle is cost, quality, and access. So think of a triangle, try to make it equilateral. What has Cheshire or Dartmouth done in their efforts to keep those components aligned and the size even? Before you respond, yeah. uh, we have online participants, do we? All right. Uh, could you repeat the question so that there's... So, make sure I got your question right. So, there is this triangle of forces out there that, in a sense, if kept equal in nature, would actually drive better outcomes, approaches, things like that. And they are interactive. It can affect one another. Right. And the question is, what is, what is Dartmouth trying to do? Yeah. Or what is Dartmouth doing to try? It's easier to answer than Cheshire. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's much easier. Well, I'm not even sure it's easier to ask for Dartmouth. Because I think it's bigger than Dartmouth. I think it's, big, it's much bigger than Cheshire. Cheshire doesn't have the, the um, levers to move any of those three things. Um, that it really is. Uh, and Dartmouth does through its Dartmouth Institute. The Dartmouth Institute has the ability to go to those people who make the decisions and try to move things like access and say, how do you actually get more doctors trained? Now, the thing you have to remember, though, is that some of those things are, are um, against what an academic institution really wants. Does an academic institution really want more physicians? Because they can't train them. And, and so that's at a, that's a most reasonable level to way to answer that question, because there's a lot of other reasons they don't want them. So, so I think that there are other forces, whether it's a political force, whether it's self-interest forces, that have kept those things from actually coming to fruition and, and keeping them balanced. So a really complicated question. Hopefully my simple answer gave you something. And years back, they actually tried to create that Kaiser-like model. And I've sat in enough internal meetings for people to say, why the heck did we, and they didn't use heck, why the heck did we ever give up Matthew Thornton? So Matthew Thornton was in managed care many years ago. And I was probably, I may have been in college when Matthew Thornton was. I was a resident. I was a resident. Matthew Thornton first came out, <coughs> which was a managed care company. And they gave it up. And, and so they were trying at that time to do those kinds of things. But without, without the biggest lever, which is the insurance company, I think it's near impossible for them to actually balance all those pieces. Uh, I don't mean to neglect the online audience. If anyone online wants to ask a question, please go on the uh, chat line, and uh, Ed will let us know. Meanwhile, other questions? Virginia. Probably a stupid question, but 
I always say there are never stupid questions. They're only dumb answers. What is the question? Right, you can get it in Canada for twenty dollars a month, right? So why why is there such a huge difference in our energy? Is it just greed or is it just regulation or it seems dramatic? So, so the pharmaceutical companies like to hide behind R and D and R and R and D is so is so expensive for them to really do that research and development. It, the reality, though, is that the, the cost is so far above their R&D that they're taking advantage of another piece of health care that I didn't talk about, but I, I wish I had. And it has to do with the, the concept that health care is a market-driven product. It's not. So there is no market force that's driving Eliquis to $700 a month. There's, there are other competitors, but Coumadin is still there. And, and Coumadin works almost as well. Well, it works just as well. Yeah, there's a little bit maybe more risk with Coumadin. The biggest problem is you have to have your, your blood checked. So they're taking advantage of the fact that there are no market forces that drive healthcare. So they get to decide themselves what it's gonna no be. Competition. It's, it, the competition isn't driven by demand. So it's not as if everyone wants Eliquis and, and they can't make enough Eliquis. So, and that's really what a market economy really functions around. Healthcare is the same thing. Their, their market forces aren't driving the cost for a total hip replacement. So it's, they're taking advantage of the same thing and they're setting their own prices. And that's why they send it off to Canada and they charge a whole lot less because people are willing to, aren't willing to pay $700. Yes. So uh, America, like all, most Western developed countries, Demographically, is aging rapidly. Um, America is not as bad as some, like Japan. China is supposed to have 400 million, 400 million senior citizens by 2035. So the question is simple: Is America's healthcare system set up to handle this aging population that is only going to get older? So all the stresses that it will put on it from hip replacement surgery to chronic diseases in late stage, et cetera. Is the system set up to handle that? My answer is no. My answer is the system's bound to fail in the model that's, that's there. One of the things that, that um, individuals, I won't name names, talk about is that we have this very underutilized mid-level group of people in, in healthcare in the US, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, <clears throat> and that we need to use more of them to actually provide the care. Problem is that if you look at any of the data that um, looks at physician interventions for people versus nurse practitioners versus PAs, the cost of care is higher because the training is so different. If you're a healthy 20-year-old, you can go see my nurse practitioner. No problem. If you are a 70-year-old with heart failure, diabetes, and, and a multitude of other chronic illnesses, someone who's been trained to take care of complex problems will keep the cost of care down because otherwise the person who doesn't know is going to refer you to the specialist. Specialty care is always more expensive. And so to me, the concept of using associate providers, it's the term I like to use, is probably also doomed to fail. And there was actually a lot of, a lot of work done to say, no, we're not in trouble because we have all these associate providers that can take care of the, the older population. My personal feeling is that's not, that's not a good answer. 
that the cost of care is going to jump. How is the this question I'm sorry, I'm going to... for the question for the online people or the rest of us who may not have heard it is that it seems more and more doctors are working for hospitals rather than in their own private practice. I, I, I want to make sure I caught the last part. You said something right at the end that I didn't catch. Well, what I wanted to know was what your opinion of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so you're absolutely right. What we're seeing in the Northeast, what we see not so much in the Southeast, uh, what we see in the Southwest um, is more and more physicians becoming aligned or being actually um, salaried positions with hospitals. And, and it's happening because the complexity of how you manage the economics and the practice and that it's also clear that there is a point of volume that needs to be obtained to, to actually make a practice feasibly possible for new physicians coming out of training. So let me give you an example. So I, I have, as, as Joe mentioned, I have two boys. Um, both of them have become docs. One's a cardiologist. Um, the other one is a pulmonary intensive care specialist. Pulmonary Intensive Care Specialist works for UPenn. He has a half million dollars in loans. I'm a doc and I can't afford to send my kids to medical school. So the, the only way that someone will pay a pulmonary intensivist is for them to work for the hospital, to pay him enough money coming right out of training, and he's right now two years out of fellowship, to pay him enough to cover his cost, which is essentially another mortgage for his medical school. So how do you actually manage that cost in your life if you live in an area where the reimbursement is not strong enough and you have to spend an awful lot of time figuring out how to pay yourself and managing the insurance companies and managing all those pieces of it? Now, juxtapose that to my son, my other son who's a cardiologist. He's a cardiologist down in Florida. Florida reimbursement for physicians is like five times better than anywhere else in the nation. He, right out of training, and he's, a, he's, a, he's an interventional cardiologist, so he's the one who puts the catheter in your heart, okay? And so right out of training, he's not in an academic institution, he's down in a big hospital down in Florida. Right out of training, he's making three times the amount he can make in the Northeast. So he's actually gone to a private group. Why? Because the economics lend itself to that, that the private group of 16 interventional cardiologists can actually survive together and pay him enough, because he's got the same thing. He has another half million dollars in, in cost as well. So it really has to do with economics and, and the economics that a portion of our nation will generate. So you can ask the question, why is it so different between Florida and let's just use New England? And it really has to do with how the politicians set up Medicare many, many years ago. And reimbursement for a Medicare procedure in, in Florida is significantly better reimbursed than the same exact procedure done by the same qualified physicians in the Northeast. So it's a whole lot more reimbursement, probably close to three times the amount in Florida that is in, in New Hampshire. So it's state-driven, not... It's actually re it's regionally driven. Okay, uh, yes, last question. So, Don, no, I'm just talking about the issue we just talked about with the hospitalists. Part of it, in my experience, too, from having managed the physicians off their practice, is a quality of life issue for the, for the physicians. Absolutely. So that the docs who now work in the physicians' office practice, no weekends, no holidays, no on call. The physician who's working as a hospitalist, he puts in his 24 hour shift, whatever it is, no forms, no insurance, doesn't have to run an office practice. So part of the transition that I found was that it was a quality of care, a quality of life issue for these dogs. Trying to manage a practice was horrendous right. because we had these you know, physicians that were 
only want to work part time. I remember right. when we would orient dogs at, at Cheshire. Right. And I would ask them, I said, what's your schedule going to be like? Well, three days, four days. I'm thinking to myself, then why can't I get a pediatrician to come in and cover a couple of nights, a couple of evenings a week so these people can see their patients? So I used to see them on the, on the pharmacy side because they, they, they would complain because they couldn't see their, their prescribers. Yeah. And so it, it just, part of, a lot of it is, is, is economic, but also part of it is, is quality of life, quality of life yep. for, the, for the practitioners. Yeah, yeah. Very different now with, and I'll, I'll call them younger physicians and what their expectations are than physicians even prior to my time period. And you know those physicians who would be there until eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night seeing patients. It, 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 that ethic is not there anymore. And the expectation is I'm not gonna do that. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I said last question, but I can never resist you, Carol. <laughs> See, I, but I would say, I, I, I'm not going to disagree with you because I think they are looking at their watch, but I think they're looking at their watch for a different reason. I don't think they're looking at a watch because some administrator is saying you have to see 27 people or 30 people or whatever. It's really more they want to be out at 5 o'clock, for, for Dennis's point, is that they want to be out at 5 o'clock so they can be with their families. And so they're, they're shortening that experience for the patient because of their own personal driver. Because from my perspective, my wife and I always figured it out. The worst thing that ever happened is we both forgot to get one kid. And, and daycare <laughs> called us and said, is somebody going to come and pick up your son? And it's like, oh, shit. And we're both at home. And we're looking at each other. You were supposed to go get him. You were supposed to go get him. So you don't want those things to happen. Um, but I think that's really what they're, they're actually doing. I don't really think that, that there's the pressure from administration that people think um, that you have to see so many people. There, there is, but the reality is, in, in practicing medicine for so long, that was never the governor for me. The governor was, I'm going to take care of what you need to be taken care of. <laughs> and, and you manage it, and you just manage it within the time frame that you have. So I think that that's, when you have enough experience, you can do that. It's really hard in the beginning. Well, before we adjourn, I want to just cover a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, to thank the sponsors of Stories to Share, Bell Tets, and the Savings Bank of Walpole. Next, our indomitable audio technology expert, Edward Taza, <laughs> and his uh, able assistant, Sean, <laughs> Sean Driscoll. Uh, I also want to thank Nancy Beltet and John Duvall who have taken on responsibility for the reception that we will have as soon as I stop talking uh, in the conference room, so please stay. And uh, I'm sure I've forgotten something or someone for which I apologize. David Beltet, President of the Jaffe Civic Association. You're welcome. Small token of oh, thank you. No need, but thank you. So informative. And I'd, well, I'd also like to make a uh, commercial announcement. We have a show that's just hung today for the last few days, downstairs and upstairs. And it, it, you know, it's opening next week. But you're welcome to walk around. It's uh, artists from around the Canandot region uh, exhibiting. So please uh, take a moment if you dare to. And thank you all, one and all, for coming. And thank you. Help yourself to refreshments. We have now reached the end of the third season. You are our 24th speaker. I cannot think of a more important 
topic than the one we talked about today. And anyone who wants to hear it again or recommend it to their friends, they can go on YouTube next week. Just go to the Jaffrey Civic Center and there will be Dr. Caruso. And next season, we are expanding from eight to nine. Uh, they will be very interesting. Please mark your calendars starting the first Friday in October. I look forward to seeing you all next year. And Don Caruso, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.